Welcome to Leadership on the Front Foot. Today we're going to explore um, a whole range of leadership topics around coaching. And um, as you know, Leadership on the Front Foot is recorded in front of a live audience. Uh, so I'm delighted that you could join us today and, and I'd love for you to pose us some questions. And um, you can do that anytime by just clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll get to as many of those questions as I can. The recording of this Leadership on the Front Foot webcast uh, is going to be available on the Capital Partners website. Um, it's also available on YouTube and now it's available as a podcast on your favourite podcast platform. So if you like what you hear, um, please feel free to subscribe and to share the link with uh, friends, family and colleagues. Now, in today's episode, we've successful sports people across the globe have got a lot of things in common, but there are a couple of big ones. Um, first, they're admired for their grit and determination. And the ones who really make it big are revered by society for their achievement, but they're also seen as leaders and role models in the communities that they serve. Secondly, and this is a big thing, successful sports people have coaches and they work together to maximise their performance. So why is it that in sport, everyone seems to have a coach, and yet in business, coaching is relatively rare? If we want better leaders in society, shouldn't we be coaching more? Shouldn't we be helping people to become better leaders? Or is it just that leaders are born? To help me unpack these challenging questions, I'm joined by a very special guest today whose work empowers leaders to stand tall. Um, now, until very recently, Kim Lancer was based in New York, where she is the founder of Tall Poppies, uh, which is a global leadership development and coaching firm. She runs leadership development and coaching programs for Fortune 500 sorry, Fortune 100 companies, that's among some of the biggest companies in the world, um, including Deloitte, Microsoft, Alcoa, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs and MasterCard. Now, Kim is a passionate advocate for women's leadership as well and diversity and inclusion. Uh, today, Kim splits her time between New York and Perth and with COVID-19 going on, I suspect there's a lot of Zoom meetings happening. Um, and uh, Kim relocated in 2019 to Perth with her husband and two boys. So Kim, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome to Leadership on the Front Foot. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. And you're absolutely right. A number of Zoom calls in these times. You can't get enough Zoom calls, huh? No. <laughs> now, Kim, you grew up in Perth. Um, you weren't born here, but you grew up in Perth. Um, but you've actually spent much of your life in Europe and London and, and most recently in, in New York. Mm. Um, I'd love you just to start by introducing yourself a bit to our audience and giving us a bit of your backstory. Yeah, absolutely. I, I literally arrived here when I was five years old and my mum told me I had this crazy American accent and still crazy like fluffy hair. Um, the accent's gone, but the hair stayed. And we grew up mainly in Mount Hawthorne and Dunkraig, um, really wonderful family, quite multicultural. So my mum's Australian, but her mum and her side of the family are Serbian and Croatian. Um, so that has its own influence on me as a leader. And my dad was English. So I remember going to my grandma's house that we called Baba once a week for dinner. Uh, the sort of situations where you see on movies where everybody's talking over each other and lots of really strong, powerful women. That was a big influence. And the next thing I remember is really being different, David. You know, I moved schools maybe four times when I was young and my hair just kept making me stand out. And you really don't want to stand out when you're a kid. So, you know, as many of us were bullied for just sort of strange things that happen and that had an imprint on my story later on in life. And mainly because my mom, you know, told me that one day it would be really good to stand out. And she told me how Nicole Kidman, you know, she has that really bright red hair, that her as a child 
whereas she wasn't very well liked and was constantly teased. Um, and she painted a picture of this wonderful woman and look at what happened to her. She became Nicole Kidner. Mm -hmm. So that was a big influence. And the last piece of growing up was really all these travel stories I heard. So my parents had lived overseas. They'd um, had this wonderful experience together in London. Um, we'd lived in the US, my sister had been born there. So I think that really had an influence on me after school, deciding to go live in Holland for a year as an exchange student. And that shifted again my view that, well, there's all different types of leaders and there's different types of cultures. And I was lucky to see a variation when I was only 18 for a year. And then of course I got stereo. I don't, I don't want to cut across your story because I'm loving yeah. it and I'm going to come back to it. But do you have any recollection of when you first became aware of the concept of leadership and, and leading versus not leading? Oh, yeah, I think actually it was, um, well, I have this immediate memory straight away of um, standing up to this little boy when I was five years old, Mark from Mount Hawthorne Primary School, and he said something and I remember telling him like not to do that. So that comes to mind straight away. But really when I thought about leading was when um, I was part of a youth group early on. And as part of the youth group, I was about 13. You were encouraged every Sunday to actually share what was happening in your life. And you had to sit in a huge circle, you know, your legs are crossed, there's all these people, it was very intimidating. And I remember getting past this sort of fear and wanting to be the person who spoke up first. And sometimes that's sort of a, a guide. And then I really enjoyed it because once I spoke, somebody else spoke. And so that was probably an early idea of, okay, takes a little bit of courage, but then look at what wonderful things happen when you start sharing. And I think that's a big part of leadership. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me take you back now to your travels, because I think that's really mm. context. Yeah. I think formative experiences um, make such an imprint on us in terms of you know, how we turn out. It doesn't always mean you know what you're going to be as a leader, but when you reflect, there's some essences there. So um, for me, I mean, essentially, I grew up um, in my 20s in London. So I studied at Curtin here. I was focused on communications. I knew the whole time I wanted to live abroad. So I moved to London straight away. I had this wonderful experience in quite a fast-paced investment banking environment and started to sort of get pulled towards people. How could I first recruit people, develop people? First, it was graduates, so just out of university, that was my age group, I could connect to them. It was on a trading floor, so it was really busy. And then later on, it became actually more focused on leaders. So I was in London, you know, my 20s, um, my sister was there as, as well, which was wonderful, she moved later on. Then I transferred over to New York, and that's really what made an indent. So I spent 11 years there, and that's when I went to NYU, so New York University, and did some adult behavioral studies. I trained and got my coaching certification, and I was really lucky to work for this amazing company that had, as you said, Fortune 100 companies, and I traveled across the US every two weeks, leading, coaching, missing Australia, mind you. I came back every year. I'm such a Perth girl at heart. So the whole time my family was here, and I really had this view that I wanted to take this Europe, you know, English experience, American experience, and then one day building into how I thought we could be leaders and coach people back to Perth. Um, so my next question, I'm really interested in the idea of tall poppies. Um, and I'll, hmm. I'll, I'll frame it in the context of that. That is a seriously impressive client list. Like you've worked with some of the cream of global businesses. And New York in particular has got a reputation for being really fast and really raw. And I imagine you've seen some pretty interesting things. Having, having been back in Australia a relatively short time, mm. I wouldn't mind just drawing out some of the things you've observed while they're still fresh in your mind. You know, you, you, that rawness of New York and aggressive, mm. uh, what, what, sorry, that's my perception. And you might, you might say, well, David, you haven't got that quite right. They're all, they're warm and cuddly. But, but what have you seen since you've been back? 
Yeah, I've seen a huge difference. I've, I find the two cultures really different and I actually really enjoy, like you said, that comparison of what you notice straight away because Australia is part of my heart. Like I am Australian, I grew up here. Um, and then you learn different ways to experience. So essentially New York, which is really the epicenter of where I spent most of the time, is very fast paced, um, very capitalist, very high achieving focused. And there's some definite benefits and some downfalls to that or opportunities, you know, if you're focused on your career there. So early days, I remember um, everybody introduced themselves literally as a resume. And I'd never had that experience before where they would say, you know, hi, I'm such and such. I have an MBA and I work here and I do this. And I, you know, partly thought, well, I didn't really ask, you know, <laughs> very different from Australia. We'd see that as kind of showing off. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's a definite, um, but essentially it's, you know, there's 325 million people there. So there's this sense of you have to stand out to get ahead. You have to stand out in New York. There is so much diversity and experience. It really feels like you're in the center. So for that, for leaders, that means you're not just identified as, you know, I work in an asset management company or um, this, you, I found people had multi-talents they gave back to philanthropy. They also ran a marathon. Um, then they were a family person. So business first, then family. That was sort of a theme. Mm. And that really drives you to want to achieve. The opportunity there is it, there's a lot of competition as well. So that can be, you know, sort of, Give you this feeling that it's not enough or you can just be focused on outcomes and sort of not enjoy the journey as much because the pace is so quick that's new york when i've come back to australia i mean obviously i i noticed that it's um down to earth you know it, there's a slower pace everybody introduces themselves from my experience around who they are as a person and their family first and business second so that's different I think there's a lovely candidness and honesty that's here um, for leaders opening up. So for example, just in the year and a half that I've been here, I've been a part of these amazing sessions where CEOs have really emotionally got vulnerable and just told leaders, you know, this isn't happening or I really want this or I feel like I've let you down. I haven't seen that in the 10 years I was there necessarily. So that's a huge strength. But on the other side, as you said, you know, I called my company Tall Poppies mm. because I don't think Australia and the culture here is as supportive of standing tall. And it's called bragging. You know, we love an underdog as opposed to just I have pride in the sort of leader I am. And therefore, I go into a bar and I tell you what I did today in a, in a really like great, powerful way. And so when I've coached leaders here, I can notice that sometimes unlocking potential and is a little bit more effort because there's a little more, bit more fear around saying, um, I am the manager, I am the leader. And I think that's an opportunity here. Mm, that's fascinating. So you, your view is that Australians don't like standing out quite as much. No. And when I think about it, I think about the messaging I heard as well. Like it, it wasn't, yes, yes, as a kid, everyone gets, everyone wants to be the same. That's normal. But it's different if you put your hand up and say, I'm the manager, you're then not a part of the other group. And I see it here just every day. You know, we want to belong and we have this really strong mateship culture here. But as a team, that means if somebody else becomes the boss, sometimes that can be quite alienating. And so you don't want to do it. And I don't hear as many people talking about their accomplishments or um, really stepping into, I'm, re I'm really happy about what I've actually done and it's okay to share it. It doesn't mean it's bragging. So I think so, that could give you a, a stronger identity and pride. So what's uh, the benefit of doing that, do you think? Just think, acknowledging, let's, let's, if I call it acknowledging your wins and, and talking mm. what, what what's the benefit of that? I mean, across multiple. Firstly, you stand in your own identity, which is I lead the team. I lead my household. I have a business. Like the more you say things that you're really proud of, the stronger you feel. 
that that's you know pure research in terms of what happens with our brain secondly people intuitively want to help people mm -hmm. and i find all the time it can be an obstacle just saying um i have a business or i'm not sure um what to do here or um instead of saying i'm acting in this position like this is the position i'm doing now i'm not just acting for a little bit so it's sort of taking away from your power but if you step in people will want to help you as well and you live in a space of yeah somebody did pick me for this or i picked myself and that changes the way we operate in the world essentially how we come home as a parent how confident we feel whether we feel we I mean, most of all, David, I think whether we feel we have permission to do things. Mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of senior leaders who feel like, well, I'm not really sure. Maybe somebody else will ask me or give me power instead of I'm going to assert this is the way I think we need to do it. And I'm doing the best that I can right now. And mm -hmm. that is enough. So let's move to your passion for um, coaching and leadership yeah. development. And um, Tell me a bit about how you developed that passion firstly. And, and I, I think it's really useful to share with the audience what does a coach, in the business context at least, mm. actually, actually do? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, it's one of these wonderful vague terms that you're not really sure that I see people think, oh, what could that mean when we're talking uh, <laughs> socially? Um, coaching for me, I think it's a, like a lot of people, you're not really sure what you want to do when you're growing up and your passion sort of grows. So it probably started because I was the person who really enjoyed listening to friends and trying to guide them. And I was very people focused. That was an inkling. Yeah. And where I found it more was really though that decade in New York, I'd really been developing people and training them, but I stepped into coaching, which is not just pure me telling that's training but coaching i think is you know even better because it's you figuring out what you should do with a guide so technically it's about unlocking potential and um, that's a lot about having support so investing in yourself while someone is there with you it's about accountability you're actually measuring your success as you go and having a safe space, especially if you're a senior leader or you just just having a safe space to actually talk and say, I'm having you know, an issue with this or I really think I can do this and you just need to be able to process it. Um, so for me, that's that empowering piece is not just mentoring either. That's the other term that gets thrown around a lot. Mentoring is pure advice. But coaching is, I'm going to be a guide and ask you questions so that you can figure out and without me afterwards, you feel really empowered and will just accelerate your success. Mm. But taking leaders from good at whatever level you're at to just great. And how do you do that without time and effort? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's come back to the sport analogy. So mm. you, you know, there's only one um, sports person I know who doesn't have a coach and that's, that's Nick. And, Nick Kyrgios and good on Nick. Um, but, you know, all the people I really admire, you know, the Federers, the Rafa, mm. the Barty's there. You know, I, lo I love the way when Barty is standing centre court and she's just won a tournament or she's not even a tournament. She's just run a, won a round match. You know, she's just made it to the quarters. Um, she always speaks in terms of we mm. our, and my team. And I, I find mm. that really really fascinating and we've got this we've got this culture or not even a culture it's a reality of in sport people have coaches you know successful mm -hmm. people have coaches period mm. um yet in business it's it's rare and not maybe not rare but it's not that common right yeah so what, very true why is that what's going on there yeah i think that's a great observation i mean in sports it makes sense to me there's a singular focus on performance you know, we're trying to get to the Olympics, we're winning Wimbledon, there's such a dedication and perseverance. And then secondly, we know it's not just a skill game, it's a mental game. Mm -hmm. You know, we see lots and lots of examples of it. So athletes who, and sports in general, really ahead of the curve. So they invest in, well, what's the quickest, best way to get there? It's through an expert who can guide and unlock my potential in these crucial moments especially because sports and business life is a lot about adversity as well it's not the wins it's the things the setbacks 
so and I mean, you mentioned Roger Federer. He used to sponsor um, the bank that I worked with. So I grew up always looking at his pictures were everywhere, you know, at the bank. And I think what's interesting about um, him is before he got a coach, he was quite um, brat. He's known for being quite bratty, you know, and was really, really talented, but really hadn't mastered his mindset. It was very much still a skill game as opposed to an attitude, a focus, like how can he really think about his capability? Um, and then tragically, his coach died right before he made it quite big. And that um, incident shifted him completely as a player. And um, now he's incredibly calm, perseverant. If you see him interview, he talks about that experience and is really focused on resilience. So that's sports, essentially, singular focus. Business, I mean, business, once upon a time, coaches were brought in to fix people. You know, and I clearly remember this um, guy that I used to work with, Jim, screaming on the trading floor in London, really aggressive. And then the next minute, we all knew he had a coach. This is, you know, early 2000s. Um, thankfully, that's changing, in, especially in corporate America. And now people realize, oh, we're not trying to, you know, push down behavior. It doesn't have a negative stigma. And organizations I work with now, they give executive coaches as gifts to high potentials and that is we believe in you we want you to go through this transition you know often when you're managing big teams or a different role and one way we'll invest in you is accelerating your success by bringing in an expert who can guide and empower you to go higher mm. that shift is really happening probably a little bit less in australia um but yeah, it's just about how you think about it and whether you can be vulnerable enough even saying, I'd like to invest in myself. Because sometimes that can be hard versus saying nothing, I totally got it and trying to be strong. Whereas I think about strong as leveraging expertise and people and connections around you. Yeah, so, so leadership on the front foot mm. really, really was born out of my fascination uh, around leadership. And, mm -hmm. and, and this, the title we gave this, a, a leader's born or made, you know, is it nature or is it nurture? Can, can we just unpack that a little bit? You know, do are people, I don't know, I, I don't know the answer to this. Are people born with certain natural characteristics that just make them way better leaders than the next person? Because it seems to me, I've, I've got this image in of my mind of the maternity, yeah. the maternity ward. And out comes a shiny new baby. And the nurses are all really excited saying, oh, great, we've got a leader. You know, wrap them in a special blanket and put a bow and a star on their on their. That, that was me, David. That was definitely me. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, you're not the next three babies who come out and they're not as shiny, <laughs> a bit dull. And, and you says, oh, damn, you know, they're, they're going to be followers. They're, that's another, we've got another follower. Um, <laughs> you sort of think that can't be right. That can't be right. No, and thankfully it isn't. Um, it's funny that you mentioned babies because I, I mean, I love reading about this and humans in general, but babies are only born with two fears, which is really relevant to your identity. You know, they're literally born of loud noises. So if you clap near a baby, you're going to see a reaction or um, of being dropped. But everything else, everything else is a human. We just learn, which is exactly relevant to leadership. We aren't made this way. We learn through very formative experiences. So first you learn through your family, the messages that you are told, like you can do this or you can't do this. Or even, you know, for me, my mum saying uh, it was going to be valued to stand out one day. That could have been a completely different message. Mm. Then through school, you know, I bet you can remember your, um, I can remember my year three school teacher's name. So again, it's messaging. So are you really encouraged or discouraged? Mm. Does someone talk to you and say, she can do this and he can do this or not? Um, then you've got, so that's, you know, two experiences. And we learn what's possible for ourselves. Uh, then you've, of course, you've got high school or some of us are lucky to have coaches. I had a running coach. So lots of people in my life, very supportive and telling me, you know, I could do this. And then you have the opposite as well. Other people who tell you, you know, when I wanted to be an 800 meter runner and the doctor laughing at me and saying, oh, don't be ridiculous. So these make imprints on us. Mm. 
along the way. And then, so then you might have university or studies or you jump straight into the workforce and you're still trying to figure it out. What does everyone think of me and how do they react? And again, you react to that again. So it's definitely a journey um, which you are in control of. You can change a lot of it. And we see amazing examples of this with people having very negative influences early on and getting uh, so much strength from it and deciding they're going to inspire others through their story. And they mm -hmm. hold on to hope and all sorts of things. Um, I do think in terms of the born piece that some people have um, more of an interest in people early on. Your know, leadership is really about getting excited, having a vision and guiding others towards this group goal. And that can be just with your family. You're leading your family. There's CFOs and COOs and, you know, mums and dads at home are doing that. Um, and you can do it on a project or um, at the PTO or all sorts of ways you can do that. Um, mm. I just think some of us might get a bit more interested in it. But that's why um, things like mentorship, sponsorship, um, really support, supporting and talking to kids early on and even later about you don't have this yet, but you could. So identity is important. Not getting told you're not a leader or you are a leader, but you're on this journey and where would you like to go? Because we'll give you the tools to get you there. Mm. So this is a perfect time to um, pose a question that's come mm. from the audience. And I think it's a great question. Um, and what you've just said has triggered a thought in my mind. And, and if you think of the great composers, the people that we, we know of today as the great composers, the likes of Mozart and Bach and others, mm -hmm. um, they lived the lives of musicians, of course, so they were quite poor, and, but they were, in some cases, precociously talented. Mm. But, but until they made it, the only way they could really, the, the only way they could really survive was by having a patron. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of the great, a lot of the great artists in the 16th, 17th, 18th century were the same. Now, this question is all about, you know, it's such a personal journey, coaching. Mm -hmm. um, how does one, how, how does one find the person that they can really connect and connect mm -hmm. with, get the support that they need on their journey? Yeah, I think it's so relevant because the biggest thing about um, developing yourself is that you have to open up and share things about yourself. So you have to feel comfortable. You find one from, and this is what I would do with anybody, and I would say it to anybody, if we sit down and meet and you don't feel relaxed or trusting or it just doesn't happen for you for any reason, then absolutely go and find somebody that you do. Mm. Because that is, and I've noticed this like, through coaching thousands of people now, the people who have the greatest development in six months or a year, they jump in and the two of us, really go through a journey together because they feel comfortable saying, I didn't make my goals. I messed up in this meeting. What do you think about this? Like just bearing it all. So the more you do that, the greater you get. And that's what I would want for somebody too. You hear and about people, you hear about people, Kim. Um, I think the phrase is wearing a mask, like people mm. wear Wear a mask. How, how, uh, firstly, can you explain what that means? And secondly, how common is it? And how do we, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, I think wearing a mask, I mean, that reminds me of um, pressure in these really top organizations. There is pressure to perform, there's pressure to come across as incredibly polished, which just isn't true. We don't operate in this perfect polished place. We're like wonderful and raw and candid and we make mistakes. So I think there's two parts. One, there's a bit of pressure to wear a mask and yet what do people like most about others and leaders and what do we get touched by? I honestly get touched when people are so real, when they tell me how they messed up and then what they learned from it. And they said they got really nervous before a speech and I think, great, me too. Mm. So we're, it's weird, it's almost contradictory and some cultures have it more and some organisations have it more as well. So you're encouraged to wear the mask a bit and yet we're so much more impacted when people don't, especially in a leadership role, which takes courage, which is why this it, it, leadership is hard and it's very key that you know who you are or just go through a bit of a journey, figure that out so you can be really true to yourself as you do it. 
Um, and then you can realize that it's not about a mask. You can actually be you and that is impacting and accelerating other people far more than trying to look you know, in this perfect sense. Mm. So trying to, yeah, is that common? People trying to be perfect? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the big themes, if I think about core themes that have come up, across over the years, it's um, especially in women, actually, perfectionism. So, and the, and the problem with that, of course, is that you're constantly self-doubting or it's not quite good enough or you're not really enjoying the success. Mm. So um, it would be very easy, even for you and I just talking now, for me to um, reflect and think, oh, why didn't I mention this? Or, oh, we could have chatted about this. But it's not really the point. The point is to be present. So actually, that's another really big focus I find with clients after year, mainly you know, 25 years, they are trying to get back to how do I be present for people? How do I really focus because I'm burnt out? And that's the other thing. So if you're really hard on yourself all the time, you will burn out. This is why I think refueling is so important. Definitely a key message that I'll always embed and talk about is being kind to yourself, which sounds really simple and you're not academic and but it's really true in my experience, almost the more senior you are, and I do a lot of coaching and banking and very um, high stress organizations, the more we talk about you need to breathe, you need to write down things that you did today, you need to think about your family, what, what everybody cares about, and, be, and just allow that to happen. Sit mm -hmm. with that, and that will give you tremendous energy to be this wonderful high-performing leader who inspires others. It reminds me of an earlier episode that I, I, I'm pretty sure you were listening to, Kim, mm. with Alex Hoff, where she talked about this concept of Deirdre. And yes. Deirdre's the lady that sits on a shoulder yeah. and tells her that she's not good enough. And I <laughs> yeah. responded with, oh, I've got one of those. And his name's Fat, <laughs> name's fat Bastard. And, <laughs> I remember. I thought that was great because you're having you know, fun with it. We, we, do, we do have this awful habit of telling ourselves we're not good enough. Mm. So, I'm interested, when does one know, when does one come to the realisation that they need a coach? How does that How happen? A coach? Yeah, I was just thinking about what you said about the negative thinking in the first place. So I find it so helpful to know that my brain is actually wired and skewed to be negative. So that in itself is in it's not me. So for every positive thought... Or for every, essentially, we need five positive thoughts to get over one negative one. So if you just think about that, you know, if you've ever had performance reviews or given performance reviews and there's strengths and weaknesses, you, you, I'll see again and again, like there might be 10 strengths and one weakness. And where do we focus? On the weakness, yeah. On yeah. the weakness. Same with kids. You know, they come home with grades and you, it could be all A's, but it's hard not to focus on or what happened there. So firstly, if you know that your brain's a little bit more skewed to be negative, then I know for myself every day when something goes wrong on the phone, which it will with clients, or I didn't quite do as much as I could, I'm going to have that thought. Mm. And then, so once I know that, I feel, and I think it's really important just to accept that in itself. That's not to ask, why am I having the thought? That's the Deirdre that you mentioned. Um, then go into a negative spiral, have more thoughts. Well, how come I'm not over this? Why do I know? Blah, blah, blah. And it just keeps going. Um, and then so to actually step into doing a few things that get you away from that thought. So this is a really interesting area. And, and um, I haven't prepped you for this, but I did warn huh. you for the fact that the questions, yeah, no, go questions could just come from anywhere. Yeah. Um, I often have a conversation with people in our organisation and also... Mm -hmm you know, I have had with children, um, you know, fear does not exist in the mm. physical world. Fear, mm. fear is a construct that belongs in our heads. So all mm. of the terrible things, I can't remember who it was. Some, um, someone famous said, um, I've had some, I've had some terrible experiences in my life and some of them actually happened. Yes, yes, I read that quote too. <laughs> I can't remember who said it, but you sort of think, it's so true. I make yes. up so much terrible stuff that's going to happen mm -hmm. to me and yet most of it never happens. Mm. Now, I guess that's prevalent for everybody. 
And, Absolutely. And I, I, in, I actually want to dig into some practical tips here about how we sure. can our audience. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm a loner here. I reckon we all do this. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some practical tips about how we can really... I don't know, get fat bastard off the off your shoulder, get beardry off your shoulder. And what, what are some things we can do, some habits, some routines that we can be in to, to focus more on the positive? Yeah. So the first thing is, if you know that you walk into a room and your brain, which is your unconscious brain is already 200,000 times faster than your conscious. So we're creatures of habit. We like doing the same thing. So firstly, if you walk into a room, your brain will notice negative things you will go more towards protecting yourself because that's just an, an instinct. We're either fight or flight. So once you just accept that, it doesn't feel as much as in, it's just you who's beating yourself up and always having this thinking. Absolutely not true. It's just us. So if you know that, the, one of the first things you need to do is actually as part of your daily life, embed positivity. Because if your brain is looking for the opposite, then apart from just dealing it in the moment, which I'll absolutely talk about, uh, you have to intentionally, and I really like that word intentionally, craft your day, craft your experience, choose what you focus on. And that's where your mindset comes into it, which I'm such a strong believer of in general. It's not just our skill or our smartness. It's really how we access what we focus on. So I can tell you ways that I do that intentionally. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I always do five minutes of breathing or meditation for longer schedule wise, so that I'm calm about what's about to happen. Then I ask myself five questions. The five questions are all about what's important to me in life. So again, that takes one minute. So I start my day, like everybody could do that. That's a six minute time investment. Um, every single day, I'll do something for myself, which recharges me. Sometimes that's, I mean, I'm really nerdy with this stuff because I'm in learning and development. So you could come up with your own. Um, a TED Talk. I listened to um, the song that I got married to just before we did this podcast. because That's really uplifting. And that 90 seconds takes me to a really positive place. I'm breathing. So yesterday I had a meeting go astray. And after it, I could feel my whole body sort of getting into a negative place. So most people try and push through in that moment. Mm -hmm. and, and instead, I literally went and walked outside for two minutes, um, had a chat, watched something funny, my favorite comedian, and then came back. And then at nighttime, um, so all of these are intentional. I plan my day out. I encourage all clients to do that, like break down problems by chunking your day into little bits so it's not a huge, big, scary, fearful thing. Mm. And then ending with gratitude. And Sean Aker does some amazing work with this, who's really focused on positivity. But my husband and I, Greg and I say three things we're grateful for every night. And once you do it for a while, it just becomes a habit. So that's sprinkling positivity in what you look for first. And then there's dealing with negativity. Mm. There's... Um... There's an entrepreneur coach out of Toronto, Gubba the name Dan Sullivan, and he works with entrepreneurs and they're business people. And so there's just a natural acknowledgement that there are going to be times when business is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. And staying on that positive side of the dial is really, really important. And he, he, mm -hmm. you know, he encourages people to write down three wins that they've had during the day, three wins, three positive Absolutely. things that happened during the day. Yeah. Because you've end the day and you're not dwelling on the bad things that might have happened you're dwelling on the good things that happen that seems to me to be a great habit too along the lines of what you're suggesting yeah absolutely um i call it win learn change so what's a win um something i learned today so that's about the future and something if i wanted to change i would change so none of it's about the past what i did wrong today um and what you're talking about is celebrating there's not enough celebrating because if your brain's constantly going to think worst case, and we know this happens to us, we just jump worst case. So if it happens, then just constantly offset it. And I really find that leaders who are very intentional or essentially really good leaders know this, and then they craft their life to be intentional around this. 
And it's actually one of the most important things because yeah. how do you um, sell? How do you influence? How are you a good dad? How are you a good mum? How do you do anything? It's about energy and whether you have the capacity to do it. So you have to feel like you can, that's your confidence, and want to, so some desire. And it's hard to do that when we're beating ourselves up about something. Mm. Now, here's another left field question. Mm. Um, a lot of our clients, uh, of course, are pre-retirees, so pre what I call pre-retirees, <laughs> or they're retired. And it's, um, it struck me a while back that, when we were thinking about, when we think about retirement, community or the society almost um, programs us to think what the best of our lives, but the most productive part of our lives is coming to an end and we're in mm. phase. Now, I want to, I want to challenge that. And I'd like to get your opinion on this around, I think all of us can look forward to a bigger future, irrespective mm. of how. I agree. How, old we are um like you know we can look to be positive we can look to mm -hmm. be engaged we can look to have great relationships we can look to do things that have a you know a purpose and a meaning that are bigger than ourselves um, mm. contribute back and how would you encourage our older um, audience to think about this because I think it would be very easy for them to dismiss this and say oh this is a young person's topic only a young mm. person what, what, what's in this for for people who may have finished work yeah for me the key word you just said there was purpose you know of course we always need purpose like how do we find happiness it that happiness is about your connections in your life and actually, I think retirement is this amazing space where you really get to enjoy your relationships and connections in life. There's maybe a little bump where you're not quite sure of your purpose. Um, but it, it makes me think of somebody I'm partnering with at the moment who um, has found her purpose to be like, how can I give back? Yeah. Um, and we and we see a lot of that as well. You know what else is funny, David? We always talk about, you know, one day, I don't know if you grew up with this too, one day we're going to win the lotto. And some people, when they win the lotto, they wouldn't work anymore, which means you're retired. Well, that's what retirement is. Like now you have all this time. People say that they've been working towards it. Um, so I think sometimes if you haven't got to know yourself very well, just by chance of when you grew up, um, reflecting on your life, answering questions about what's important to you, um, what's strengths of yours. Who are the five people you spend the most time with? They have such a big influence on your life. Are you actually honoring things that are important to you every day? Um, what could you contribute? If you wanted to, there's like often lots of capacity to do that at that exact point without the restraint of work. If you think about work as that, depends if it's your passion piece or not. You know? I'm fascinated by the concept of the modern elder, this idea. Mm -hmm that you reach a point in your life where you've got so much wisdom, hard earned mm. wisdom, and then you leave the workforce and where does that wisdom find an outlet? Mm -hmm. uh, now I want to, I want to shift our conversation because we're, we're getting to that point where we'll, we need to, we'll need to wind up, but, and it's then it's coming too soon, but I want to, I want to, I want to dig into this concept of parent and grandparent as coach. Mm. Um, you know, I, I father of three, as, as many of the audience will know, and, and um, I learned very quickly that telling, telling ain't selling. Telling, telling isn't, <laughs> isn't going to convince many people. Um, how can we be better parents and grandparents and mm. aunties and uncles and, and better elders? You know, elder... Elder in our society has this connotation of old, and yet elder in in indigenous societies around the world, the elders are revered, the wisdom is revered. How, mm -hmm. how can we be better examples, specifically in the context of leadership and coaching mm -hmm. for our younger people? Yeah, I think it's so important to coach versus tell your kids, and also hard, because it's counterintuitive. 
you know, we know so much, we're trying to protect them. Um, and it's funny because my 16 year old said to me the other week, and it was really hard for me to coach as well when I want to tell, um, you know, I said to him something along the lines of, you know, well, I know best in this situation. And he said, yeah, absolutely you do, but you don't know me as well as me. And it's so true. So how you really coach is, I think about key moments. Um, so for instance, we just went through something uh, around study and discipline for year 11 exams. So I knew, I know, essentially, if you have emotion about a topic, which we often do as a grandparent or a parent, I wouldn't just go into it. I would always plan it. Mm. So I sat down and just planned, here are two open questions I'm going to ask. What are you thinking about study? Um, what's motivating you right now instead of what I wanted to do, which is this is how you should be studying and this is what works. Yeah. So shifting the statements to questions and doing it essentially around key topics. Um, the second thing is really easy just to ask one question and then go, oh, okay, great. But if you dig in, I've noticed I find out so much more for, about the boys from just saying, what's that like? Or um, what do you think would work for you? What do you care about? What have you heard? And that's three more questions after just one question. Mm. And then I've never felt closer to them, you know, in those moments. So there's nothing too hard about it in the moment. All you need to do is not judge, which is hard. So it's kind of kind of um, ask open questions and really listen from curiosity. So Greg and I, my husband and I, even when we had that conversation with our 16 year old, halfway through it, we could tell that both of us were going to switch into telling again. And we had to call each other out. Just, no, no, this is great. What next? And then um, we allowed uh, Alex to write down what he had planned to do. So I'm just there as the guide. Like, and then I gave him some accountability as in well, whatever you come up with in coaching you, you write it down and you figure it out and I'll help you and we're here for you and then let go, mm. which is funnily enough what I'm doing with clients as well. I'm doing as much as I can in the session, but it's your work to do, but I'm here to really hold you. And that's what great leaders do too. Like, in fact, one of the best leaders that you, they give you this feeling of I've got your back. So that's what grandparents do. Like I've got your back. It's about trust. Let me have a conversation. Same with parents. Whatever you did, tell me. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating, you know. Um, I'm going to talk about our next episode in the, in the in the wrap up. But this whole concept of you find yourself in this stressful situation, a child or or someone said something that that has, for whatever reason, just pulled your chain and and or set off set off an alarm in your head, and you say, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, my my response to this is. Mm. My, you know, I'm not happy about this. The situation has got you on edge. It's how you respond mm. that is the critical thing. Mm -hmm. So taking a deep breath, stepping back from the situation, understanding that they're human too and there's stuff going on for them becomes, I think as parents, not, maybe not grandparents, grandparents have got a great role, haven't they, in, in our society where, where they can really be the child's friend and they can be yes. a confidant they can yes. it's, a, it's a very very precious um time and relationship mm. yeah now before we run out of time i mm. i want to um switch into a passion area for you mm. a few episodes ago we had diane smith gander uh on the um podcast and she was very matter of fact about the the economic value of ensuring women had great opportunities, equal mm -hmm. free in business. You know, she's just, this is madness not to, not to ensure this happens. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is an area that you're passionate about, the, the challenges that women have in the, in the workforce. Can, can, you, can you share with us a little bit of that, you, your research and your observation around some of the unique challenges that younger women have? In, in emerging as leaders? Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and I connected to what she was saying because she was talking about the value of it. I think we're past this point where we 
almost need to talk about the value of it. There's all sorts of studies on if you have more diverse thinking, if you have um, mixed focuses and strengths, of course, that's the best thing to do. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. So essentially, um, you know, a few things like if you think about Fortune 100 companies, only 6% of the CEOs are females. If you um, go to Australia, um, there's such a small percentage of actually really senior leaders. And yet then you go to um, undergraduates. I remember looking at those stats for 2018, when, which is just before I moved here. And there are more female graduates coming out of universities. There's 57%, there's 43 for men. But the drop off of actually senior women, and it's not just about life choices, um, is disproportionate. So a lot of that is just, we need to see female role models in order to be it. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we are, we, my generation, um, my kids, yours, that we're all growing up in a world where we can't be what we can't see, but there are more senior men out there in these positions. So that's essentially how my kids are learning about the world as well. So what I think is really important is to talk about the fact that media is influencing our view and we have set views of women um, and men and it's it's unfortunately it is biased and it's not equal out there so what can we do and the things that you can do are tremendous then in terms of shifting the balance and making it a little bit fairer so walk us through some of those some of those suggestions yeah well we have fun at home you can imagine because my husband's a coach as well so uh, and we've got two boys I'm 11 and 16 so um, a number of things. One, um, when we watch movies, I'll point out stereotypes. So if you think of movies, most heroes are men across the board. Um, most of the men that they see on TV. So we're so influenced by media. Even myself, you know, I have unconscious bias. If, just because I grew up with male having this type of role and females having this type of role. Even though I know that's not necessarily true and that there's not a strength here or there. Um, so movies, you can identify superheroes. Um, we go out of our way to talk about female leaders. So they're going to hear about all these male leaders. So I'll talk about Jacinda. You can talk about the Prime Minister of New Zealand or how um, the leader in Germany is female or the CEO of IBM or Heineken. So drop le female leaders' names at home. That's one. Um, even the books that they buy, um, or there's that movie Inside Out that talks about emotions and has children think about emotions so they can deal with it. Moana, so a Disney movie that has a female central character, they're not going to see that. So they're not going to consciously think females can't achieve it, but it doesn't matter what I say, media is far more powerful. Amazing. Um, with that. So the other thing, I mean, Greg does an amazing job of this. He constantly talks about the value that I'm bringing as a mum, as a business owner versus just him because his is implied. We know his already. Um, we, we don't, we stay away from language, which, you know, I probably grew up with accidentally. We all say language accidentally. So lang changing a language is powerful. You know, don't run like a girl. I'm just a school mum. Things that take away from our power. We don't have a school dad phrase. Um, we have this connotation, you know, I think it's fascinating to watch girls when they're running early on, they run really powerfully. And then somewhere along the way, they watch media and they learn, oh, I need to run differently, a little bit softer, a little bit kinder. Um, so all those sorts of things you can change in your language as well. And then as a leader in organizations, I think females assert yourself more. You know, ask for what you want. Um, but that self-belief is key. Um, getting a sponsor, not just a mentor, that's key. There's a lot of research on mentors are great. We get advice, but sponsors really advocate. I really noticed that during COVID, David, a lot of clients, their male um, clients are emailing and talking about what they've accomplished because they're at home now working remotely. But females are not doing that as much. So that's an imbalance. So go out of your way to actually brand and talk about your contribution. And then um, for male leaders, you know, are you like just contemplating that we might have bias, not just male leaders, all of us. 
you know, there's a wonderful test you can do online. I love doing it. Nine million people have done it. It's the implicit association test. And it just tells you how biased you are. And once how, you do we, think, how do we find that? The implicit oh, it's, on, um, it's online. You could literally type Harvard implicit association test. So there's, you know, there's, do you prefer um, people of color or white? You know, I have all sorts of biases going on. I grew up mainly white, even though I did all this diversity work in the US. So I still have a view of white people as stronger and think things that are not true, but I've just seen more examples of it. So I think just playing with, the first step is playing with, oh, maybe I think of women in this role and men in this role, not consciously, just accidentally. So if you figure that out, then you could think as a male leader, um, who's my go-to person? Am I creating any sort of boys club accidentally? How do I create more inclusion? Who runs the meeting? Do we share it? Um, how do I learn? Well, asking questions. So there's all sorts, of, all sorts of things that you can do to actually change the trajectory. Um, and really that's about unlocking everybody's potential, but mm. women who it's not quite even, just like other minorities as well. Well, let's keep let's keep working on that one. Mm, indeed, um, Kim. As we wrap up our time together, I'd really love you to share just a couple of brief thoughts, key insights, if you will, on leadership um, lessons that I guess you've taken from the leaders that you have admired most in your career. Mm, I. I admire most actually um, Oprah right now. She has been a role model for me because she's an example of somebody who just speaks her truth all the time. I think that's one of the most powerful things. You know, I've read millions of books on leadership. Everyone has our own view. One of the most important things is that you're being you and being a leader in that way. So she's confident and states what she thinks about the world. What an amazing thing when she does that, she gives me permission to do it too. And I'm still on my journey in the way I do that. Um, so in terms of tips on leaders, I think really asking yourself questions and um, thinking about what, what does your day look like first, which sounds tiny, but unless we start with something every day, it's much harder to do it as a, a big, big picture. So every day, how am I refueling? You can't be a leader for others if you're not doing something for five minutes for yourself. So take care of your energy. And what are you doing to stay positive every day? And I meant, you, know, um, you just said you did meditation as well. All sorts of things. What are you reading? How do you keep yourself focused on uh, possibility in the future? For example, really easy to ask what went wrong when a project gets, goes off skew. Great leaders ask, um, how will we solve it? So shifting the types of questions that you ask. That takes intention, mm. just that in itself. Um, if you're looking for reading things as well, or you know, do you have an interested audience? I'm... Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just thinking for people who like reading or um, thinking more about things, but you tell me how you're doing time-wise. No, no, no. I think we're nearly done, Kim. It's been, no. it has been absolutely fantastic having you on the show today. I really, no. really appreciate it. And um, thank you so much for sharing your really rich insights. Um, you know, we think about leadership a lot in the context of, you know, everyone can be. No. Um, not everyone knows how to be. And, um, you know, if we, and I'd love to think that there would be audience members of any age thinking as a result of our time together today that hmm, maybe I need to find myself a coach because um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'd really like to think about my life uh, having a bigger future. So I really, mm -hmm. really appreciate you joining us today. Ah. And thank you to our live audience for joining in and uh, for posing your questions. I really appreciate it. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode with Kim. Um, as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to subscribe for future episodes. And if you like what you hear, share the link and subscribe. Now, our next episode is very special. Um, a book was recently released in the United Kingdom and it's called Living Life Above the Line by Stephen and Mara Klemich. And they're gonna be joining me from London uh, in two weeks time. 
and uh, that uh, will be a fantastic one to tune into. So I hope you can join us again and uh, have a great day. Thanks for joining us.